I have I have met well we met we met in the late 70s late 70s when he was just a kid st starting out studying the school medals the Boston school medals so we've known each other forever he's recently fairly recently retired and uh, focus yes uh, and his focus now is beekeeping and and still on the medals right so he is he is going to talk about the mysterious secret societies in, in college medals. Great. Thank, thank, you, um, thank you very much, Anne. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here today. Yeah, thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today. I, I thank all of you for, uh, for joining us. Um, and want to thank Anne especially for everything that she's done to organize this. It's, uh, it's been a long time in the making and uh, hopefully you all have a good time. I'm going to um, talk, as Anne said, about the early American College Secret Society medals. And um, uh, I had given this uh, um, presentation at the ANA convention and John Adams liked it so much they twisted my arm to give it again. Hopefully this time I'll remember some of the facts a little bit better. Um, but as we did then, I, I actually encourage you, certainly during my presentation, to just ask questions along the way. If you, if you want to know something or if I've got something wrong, uh, just raise your hands um, and we'll make it kind of more interactive. This is such an awe-inspiring place that uh, you know, many of us would feel too humble to just ask a question, but I encourage you to do that. And then I'll try to go through it fast enough so that we can leave time for some questions at the end. Um, one of, the, one of the really exciting things about collecting probably anything, but certainly medals in the internet age is the ability to go online, find something that's very obscure that maybe only you know something about, or maybe you don't even know anything about it, but it, it appeals to you, and to be able to buy it and, and add it to your collection, uh, research it, and understand you know, something that's very obscure um, and, and uh, understand its background, its history, the stories of the people associated with it, and actually it's true value. You know, there are a lot of, a lot of um, uh, bargains out there for people who know what they're looking for. So imagine, if, imagine the joy of being able to go online and not only find pieces that are obscure from obscure organizations, but from organizations that were intentionally obscure, that were secret, and often a little bit mischievous. Um, you know, I want to tell you today about these medals from early America, from about the, the beginning, the early part of the 18th century up until the, say, second quarter of the 19th century when Greek letter fraternities superseded most of the secret societies in, uh, in America. And, um, and, and tell you about you know, some of the stories, hopefully, not so much the, you know, the history of the society, but some of the funny stories that go along with some of these clubs. Um, most of them are no longer in existence. Uh, Phi, Beta Ka Phi Beta Kappa, which started as one of these secret societies, is, many of them are defunct. Some have been at various colleges resurrected in the 60s, 70s, 80s, as people have come to understand the early history of these, uh, you know, these clubs at their colleges. Uh, and some of them, I still, you know, even ha after having spent hours, hours and hours on the internet trying to figure out what they were, still don't know what they are. So um, there, are, there are some of those still. Um, so let's, uh, so what I want to do, I've sort of divided it up into three areas, uh, or uh, half a dozen areas. I'm going to talk about just in general early American uh, secret societies and colleges. We'll talk about some of the very early colonial period secret college secret societies tell you a little bit about Phi Beta Kappa that was established in 1776, and then some of the other college societies that had medals that I know of. How that got um, superseded by the Greek letter fraternities in the 1820s, 1830s, and then a little bit about collecting these pieces. And if being here today is not exciting enough, I just bought three of them from Tony Terranova, so I'm very excited about that. Um, you may, you may already know that, um, that there were clubs and, and secret societies in early America. Uh, 
some of them we know very little, if anything, about. Um, the Charleston Social Club, um, I think we only know from the medal, the Betts medal, which I think is Betts, what is it, 508 or something like that. Um, but you, you may also know, um, you also know if, if you've read uh, Franklin's autobiography that he had formed a secret society. He is, um, as he said in, in 1727, I had formed a club of mutual improvement which we called the Hunto. Every member in his turn would produce one or more queries on any point of morals, politics, or natural philosophy to be discussed by the company and once in three months produce and read an essay. We had from the beginning made it a rule to keep our institution a secret, which was pretty well observed. The intention was to avo avoid applications from improper persons for admittance, some of whom perhaps we might find it difficult to refuse. So that's a fairly uh, generous and politically correct way of saying, you know, you had a secret society and they, they didn't want people to know about it and they didn't want people to know what they were doing. Um, and what they discussed, I'm sure they did discuss morals and uh, politics and natural philosophy, but they probably discussed a lot of other stuff as well. Um, and then I'm sure you know about the, the, um, the Freemasons, uh, which are uh, said to have originated in uh, medieval times among the stonemasons who were building the cathedrals and so on, but became very popular in England and then very soon after that in the uh, American colonies in the early 18th century. Um, this, is a, this is a medal from um, an American uh, Masonic medal from the early 19th century, and you can see it's a lot more folky and, uh, and uh, crude than some of the British medals and even some of the American medals that you may have seen. I think Baldwin St. James just auctioned a big collection of British medals in June, and some of those are done by the finest silversmiths in London, whereas this is, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more American. Um, the Masons were a secret society, and it was a little bit controversial, but a lot of the, you know, all of the um, famous people that you know, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Paul Jones, they all belong to the, the Masonic fraternity, and it still is on today. It's not as secret as it used to be, although there's still some, some secret elements of it. The point is that as we talk about college medals, the college secret, like unlike many other things, college in the United States today, which grew out of the European tradition of colleges, whether that's from you know Oxford or Cambridge or the German universities and so on, the American college secret societies really grew out of the Masonic tradition. It, it grew out of the European tradition but you don't have these same secret societies in Britain or Germany, at least not that I know of. Maybe they were better at keeping their secrets. But um, you know, the, the, early, the secret societies that are at uh, Oxford and Cambridge, for example, weren't formed until the, the 1820s, 1830s, where we had uh, our college secret societies about 100 years before that. Um, so at the time of the revolution, there were almost 20 uh, early American colleges. Harvard was the oldest. It was started in 1636. William and Mary was not until 1693, and then there were a bunch of them that were formed in the 18th century, and many of them had secret societies. As I said, they were patterned after the Freemasons. They served both social and academic purposes, and in many cases, there were two or sometimes three of these societies that were formed, and they competed against each other. Uh, they debated each other. They pulled pranks on each other, and um, in many cases, the reason that there was a second or third was because they were secret and exclusive. Somebody who was not admitted to that original one at a lot of these colleges then went on to form the other one. Um, only a very few of them set up branches. Um, the, you know, having a, like a national fraternity, the way that we think about it today, whether it's Sigma Chi or Theta Delta Chi or whatever, is something that really happened much more in the, in the 1830s, 18 to 1850s. Um, they all, almost all had membership medals, little silver medals that we'll talk about today, some gold. Um, a few of them also had award medals for uh, succeeding in a debate or for giving an essay or you know, for whatever. And I'll show you a few of those as well. 
Um, so let's talk about the, the, these college secret societies. The earliest ones were at Harvard, uh, you know, naturally since that was the earliest college. The first one was the mock club, um, then there was the spy club. The one that actually still exists, uh, a descendant of which exists today, is, was the Harvard Speaking Club, which was founded in 1770, which uh, soon after that was called the Institute of seven, 1770, um, and then eventually merged into the Hasty Pudding Club, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, and that still exists today as Hasty Pudding Theatricals, and you may be familiar with their annual um, big production in Harvard Square, uh, theater production, and then they also give awards to celebrities who come to Boston and get, you know, roasted. Um, so that one still exists today. I'm not aware of an early medal from that institute, from um, Institute of 1770, although those of you who know uh, Boston medals will know that um, in, a, in the mid-19th century there's a struck medal from the Institute. Uh, Phi Beta Kappa and Porcelain, I'm going to skip over for a moment to talk about Hasty Pudding which was founded in 1795, and it was originally a bunch of students uh, who just didn't like the food at the, uh, in the dorm and, um, and decided they would make up some hasty pudding, which is today you would call Indian pudding. You could go to Durgan Park downtown and get it for dessert there. It's cornmeal, molasses, and milk, all boiled up for a long, and baked for a long period of time. And they thought it was so much fun having this hasty pudding that they started a club. And there's even a, a, an original silver medal that I've seen a photo of, an old photo of, in the Harvard archives. Um, and as I said, that still exists today. Phi Beta Kappa um, was founded in 1781. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. The Porcellian Club, though, which uh, this is an early medal of from the Massachusetts Historical Society collection, was, uh, was similar to Hasty Pudding, started by a group of students who didn't like, the, um, didn't like the food in the dorms, and one of them bought a pig and uh, brought it up to his room, and at that time they had window boxes, you know, that were basically a box where they stored their stuff, and they put the pig in the box, and this pig, you know, this little pig was squealing. And the proctor comes up and, you know, like knocks on the door. They put the pig back in the window box, shut it up. And he says, what's going on here? And, and, uh, and you know, oh, nothing, we're just studying. So the proctor goes away. And, uh, and they thought that was great fun. So after a while, they, they squeeze the pig's ear. And to make it squeal again, proctor runs up. What's going on in here? And, uh, and uh, they said nothing. And after a while, they kind of like, you know, they'd had enough fun. And, and somebody said, you know, they're going to send somebody in here to like search the place. We better do something with this pig. So they cooked the pig and, uh, and ate it. And they thought that was great, kind of like the Hasty Pudding Club. And they said, well, let's form a club. And, and there had been a club, I think it was called the Argonauts, but they decided to call it the Porcellian Club, Por pork from uh, the Latin for pig. And it, it's a, um, you know, it turned into what's now a very elite final club at uh, Harvard. And there's a lot of um, uh, controversy about the final clubs at Harvard that, you know, I won't go into today. But uh, the members of this, I mean, it goes all the way back. Everybody wanted to be in the club. And uh, there are a bunch of really famous people who were in it. Uh, there's some famous people who were disappointed that they weren't in it, like FDR. But um, you know, still exists today, and there there are these early hand engraved medals, but there are also um, uh, struck medals. After they merged with the Knights of the Square Table, and I think it was the 1830s, there are these I think eight pointed star medals that you can collect. Maybe there's one up in one of the cases upstairs. Uh, and its motto, uh, which I won't read the Latin and butcher the Latin, but while we live, let us live. Um, as in so many other things, Yale followed Harvard. Um, and, so, uh, and so they also had uh, literary societies, the Cretonia, the Linonian, the Brothers in Unity. And the Cretonia, if I remember correctly, didn't last for long, but the Linonian, Linonian and the Brothers in Unity lasted actually for a long time, from the mid-18th century well into the 19th century. And those were the two, the two main 
competing literary debate uh, societies, secret societies at Yale for, for many decades. Uh, again, we'll skip Phi Beta Kappa, I'll come back to that, but then there's the Phoenix, the Calliopean Society, and Skull and Bones you may have heard of because both Presidents Bush uh, were members of Skull and Bones and, and it's like the Porcelain Club is still going today, is still somewhat controversial, still very elitist and, still, and so on. So Yale also had, um, had these clubs. Um, the earliest club, secret society, college secret society that I know of that actually had medals was at William and Mary and it was the FHC and uh, it was established in 1750. Nobody knows what FHC actually stands for. It's still secret. Um, it's believed to be fraternitas, humanitas, cognito, brotherhood, humanity, knowledge. Although at the time, somebody knows? Uh, I think sort of the way you get into a secret society today in college or any secret society, which is you get to know people and they say, ah, oh, that guy would be a good member of this society. So it was a little bit of, you know, getting tapped and probably some people doing a little bit of trying to figure out who's in it. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting things about these secret societies is some of them tried to keep their existence secret. So you might not even know that this society existed until somebody tapped you on the shoulder and said, y you know, you're a jolly fellow, you know, let us tell you about this and would you like to be a member? In a lot of cases, the existence of the society was known, but you wouldn't know anything about it. Uh, and in other cases that we'll talk about, most things about the society were known, but there were still, there, and even society, some of these societies today, um, people know, most of the things about them and their existence is not uh, secret, the membership is not secret, but there's still secret aspects. Uh, you know, the, the handshake is secret or the motto is secret. And some of these things, um, you know, you just don't know. But that's, it, it's, it's, they're social organizations. So, like everything social, it's kind of, you know, some of it's open, some of it's not. But um, this was called the Flat Hat, uh, everyone called it the Flat Hat Club. And, um, and there was a, and, and the, um, the corresponding competitive society was PDA, which nobody knew what that stood for either, but uh, everyone called that one the Please Don't Ask Society. And, um, and Jefferson was a member of this, although um, it, late in his life, uh, he wrote a letter, there's a, there's a letter in the, arc, in, I think it's the Archives of William and Mary that he wrote to a friend saying, oh yeah, I was a member of the FHC, there were only six people in it, and frankly, I don't know what good it was. Um, you know, so, he, and he said, and I don't even know if it exists anymore, and indeed it did not. You know, I think he wrote that in 1819, and the club had been disbanded in the 1780s, uh, the early 1780s during the Revolutionary War. So anyway, these are two examples of FHC medals, which are the earliest um, uh, of these medals that we know of. Um, and and all, almost all of these early American colleges had membership medals. So here's one from the Cleosophic Society at Princeton, which still exists today. There was also the American Whig Society there, and they, the, those two organizations merged in uh, 1928 and still exist. Um, uh, and, and they all, a lot of them had, in this period, uh, while the Greek fraternities had Greek mottos, almost all of these had Latin mottos. So in this case it was, again, I won't say the Latin, but be rather than seen. And many of them also have this clasping hand, this friendship motif at, on, on it. And that just says Cleosophic Society Instituted, uh, 1765. Uh, it was started by, um, Aaron Burr, among others, uh, the American Whig Society was founded a, only a couple of years later, I think it was 1768, by James Madison, among others. Um, so that gives you a sense of kind of who was in these societies. Some of them also had award medals. So in this case, the Clio, Clio um, had this award medal, 
which is actually quite large. It looks kind of small. It's probably like two inches. Just the, the metal itself uh, is two inches, and it was fashioned into a key. Um, you may be aware the, of the Phi Beta Kappa keys. Those were not originally keys. Those were just metals, um, and you know, people were, they were worn, and so people felt like, well, how can I make this more useful than just wearing this silver metal? And they would go to their local jeweler and have put on a little ring and then a little steel ferrule that could be used to, to wind their watch if they had a watch, and so, and, and hence the evolution of these metals into uh, keys, what we call keys. At the time, these were not, and all of these metals were not called metals. They were called either emblems or, um, in some cases, keys, um, most, most often emblems. And it was an emblem of your membership in the, in the club. Uh, as I said, some of them had, um, uh, you know, awards. This one says it's for, um, you know, kind of eloquence or debate or something. Um, you don't really know, but it was, it was an award, and, and that Latin, uh, abbreviated Latin, tells when it was given and so on. You might notice on the obverse on the left, up at the top, there's a little bit of an, and I don't know whether it's actual or fake, hieroglyphics. It's sort of like little squiggly lines that look like hieroglyphics. And I just don't know whether though that actually means something or whether it's just indicative of the still secret nature of, of that club. Um, so Phi Beta Kappa was established. Uh, oh, sorry. So, um, uh, what does cliosophic mean? I think it, it refers to uh, Clio, the muse of poetry and history, and sophic means knowledge of. And so it's um, knowledge of history, knowledge of poetry, that sort of thing. Um, you know, actually, there's, a, there's a, a broader question that goes with that, which is a lot of these uh, clubs were philo something, philosophic, philo uh, whatever, and, and it's love of, uh, you know, so they were Greek composite names. And although these clubs were not affiliated with each other, oftentimes you find clubs with the same name at multiple different colleges? So that's a good question. Um, Phi Beta Kappa was founded at William and Mary in 1776. And, and um, while that particular um, club itself only lasted for four years, it was disbanded in, in 1781 uh, as Cornwallis's troops were approaching, actually. Um, because uh, there was somebody who was at William and Mary who had attended Yale and then graduated from Harvard and was there shortly after that. Uh, they decided that they, when he went back to New England, that he would establish chapters of Phi Beta Kappa at Harvard and Yale. And so um, there was a chapter established at Yale in 1780. There was a chapter established at Harvard in 1781 by this fellow, Alicia Parmeli. And it's because of those, because of that action of establishing the, um, those chapters, those, uh, those alphas, they called them, uh, that Phi Beta Kappa still exists today. Um, this is a very early, mem uh, early medal from Yale. Um, it's from, from what I can tell, from about seven, between 1780 and 1785. And when Parmeli went up to, back, back up to Yale and back up to Harvard, he brought with him not only their charters, but, the char but he also brought an example of the silver medal, and the charter said, just as, we, just as we here at William & Mary do, you will give each one of your members one of these medals exactly like this. This is not precisely what the William & Mary medal looked like. The Harvard medal um, is actually almost exactly what the original William & Mary medals looked like. So this is one from uh, the, probably also the 1780s from Harvard. And, um, and while Phi Beta Kappa at William & Mary went out of business in 1781, uh, Yale's uh, was dormant for 15 or so years, and I think it was the, 17, uh, the 1870s, 1880s. Harvard's has continued 
uh, has, has operated continuously since then, and so is the oldest of the Phi Beta Kappa chapters now in existence today. Um, all of the Phi Beta Kappa medals that you see from all of the chapters are all dated 1776, except for Harvard's. Uh, when you see the 1781 date, you know that's a Harvard medal because those, they date it from the founding of their particular um, uh, chapter. Um, going back, uh, as you can see, the, the Phi Beta Kappa is Greek, is Greek abbreviation for uh, love is the learning, love of learning is the guide of life, and SP uh, is, is an abbreviation for the Latin Philosophical Society. Um, the hand pointing to the three stars uh, refers to, let's see if I can get this, if I get this right, um, the, the three aims of the society. I'll come, I'll come back to that. But um, when, when these medals, when they founded the fourth society, I think it was at Dartmouth in 1787, and then there was one founded at Bowdoin a few decades after that, and Union College a few decades after that, the, um, the subsequent chapters were not really clear on what the stars were and how many stars there should be, and somebody interpreted it as, well, we're the fourth chapter, we'll put four, ch four stars on our medal. The next one said, well, we're the fifth chapter, we'll put five stars on our medal. And they kept going until they got to be a lot of stars, and somebody said, well, you know, whoa, 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 you just can't keep going forever when they got up to seven. And then somebody said, well, we'll go back to three. So now there are three stars on, on all of these medals. And the medal has, has um, just as the, as the um, as the society itself has evolved, the medals have evolved from these little, about one inch square silver medals to in the 1790s and in especially in the 1800s, early or, or first decade or so of the 1800s, they evolved from being silver or a few of them or even brass to being gold and to being keys. So you see not only the gold, but you see that little it's a real iron ferrule, it's a watch key that somebody has basically had a jeweler put onto the bottom of this little square emblem metal uh, so that he could wear it and use it. And, um, and the, the engraving on these early metals varies dramatically. Some of them have different numbers of stars, uh, name, not name, school, not school. Um, some of them are, are very ornate and it wasn't really until the early 20th century that they got standardized to, to, as, a man, as a manufacturer took over uh, and, and manufactured a metal for all of these different um, chapters of Phi Beta Kappa. The three main changes in Phi Beta Kappa, you, you, would, you of course know that it's an honorary society today, it's not really a secret society. That didn't change until about the 1830s. Uh, there was, um, Harvard, the, the Harvard administration basically forced the Phi Beta Kappa chapter at Harvard to give up its secrecy. And it was a, a result of um, a, sort of a big controversy in the 1820s. There was, a, there was an anti-Masonic anti feeling um, in, in the country at that time that grew out of what's called the Morgan Affair. And this fellow Morgan, um, uh, who lived in upstate New York, decided that he was going to publish all of the secrets of the Freemasons. And, you know, obviously the club, the organization was pretty uh, uptight about that. So uh, somebody in the um, law enforcement drummed up some charges and they arrested him, so they put him in, in their jail. And then he mysteriously disappeared and everyone assumed he was murdered. And that got a lot of press nationally, you know, in the, in the early country. And it, it caused this reaction against the Freemasons. There had always been sort of this anti-Masonic feeling among the clergy. The clergy did not uh, the uh, clergy did not like uh, secret societies in general, and the Freemasons in particular, because they viewed them as secular and anti-Christian. But uh, but you know, once this Morgan affair happened. 
a lot of other people besides clergy members kind of jumped on the bandwagon. And so Harvard in 1831 basically said, okay, you can't be secret anymore. And that led to a lot of other uh, of the secret societies, but Phi Beta Kappa in particular, giving up their, their secrecy. The second change was uh, in the 1840s, it evolved from being a real society, a club where they had meetings and there were secret elements to being more of an honorary society, very similar to what it is today. And then the third major change didn't happen until the 1870s when uh, Yale admitted the first African Americans in 1874 and the University of Mar Vermont admitted the first women in 1875. And so those are the three main changes from what these, what Phi Beta Kappa was in the early, uh, its early existence to what it, what it is today. Um, I, I, this has nothing to do, it has to do with Phi Beta Kappa, it doesn't have anything to do with college secret societies, but this is a great satirical medal from the Kappa Beta Phi Club, which was established in the early 20th century by some wise guys uh, at some college uh, to make fun of Phi Beta Kappa and these secret societies in general. And, um, and you can see the pointing hand points not to the three stars, which are the, you know, the ideal, uh, the symbolic ideal, but rather to the beer stein. And the, uh, and the, and the, um, uh, the motto there is, while we live, we eat and drink. And that's what they did. Um, the, the only, there is still a chapter of this, the Wall Street chapter of this still exists, and they get together once a year for a black tie dinner to celebrate the spirit of 1928-29, before the crash, so that's what they do. Anyway, um, so a lot of these other colleges had secret societies. At Dartmouth, for example, the two main societies there were the Social Friends, which was founded in 1783, and the United Fraternity and, um, in 1786. There was also later in the 1820s a literary Adelphi Society that existed only for a handful of years uh, but had medals similar to these two other societies. And um, the point that's I think is most interesting here is its um, um, oath of secrecy is, is actually preserved. You solemnly affirm that you will never divulge anything respecting the Constitution, the transactions, or any other secret soci secrets of the society. So help you God. And as with uh, Phi Beta Kappa at Harvard, uh, by the 1830s, the, you know, they were basically forced to get rid of that oath. Um, and again, these medals are, you know, they're roughly an inch, inch and a half uh, are the dimensions. You know, the oval and the diamond-shaped ones are probably an inch and a half um, high by, you know, three quarters to an inch wide, and very thin, very thin hand engraved, not well hand engraved. Um, these two societies were uh, at each other's throats. The, you know, they competed for members, they each had their library before Dartmouth itself had a library. Um, uh, they pulled pranks on each other, and it was so bad that by the early 19th century, the faculty sat them down together and said, look, this, you just can't keep doing this. Here's how we'll do this. We'll, by lot, assign every incoming freshman either to one of you or the other. They don't have to join if they don't want, but we can't have you fighting over these people. We will assign who they'll be, and if you can convince them to join, great, but otherwise leave those kids alone, if you would please. So that, that gives you some sense of the, of the um, uh, competition between at least a couple of these clubs. None of these clubs still exist at Dartmouth, although, interestingly, my, my younger son went to Dartmouth, and in addition to Greek letter fraternities that they have there, they do still have senior secret societies, and it's not until graduation day that uh, the members of those secret societies divulge who they are, and as they parade in, they have these emblems and stuff. But, um, uh, there are even still secret societies there today, just not these. Um, Union College had uh, a Calliopean society that changed its name to the Philomathian Society. And I, I don't know if you'd call this a medal. It's actually more like a button or a lapel pin kind of a thing. But um, this is, again, similar to, this is probably an inch and a half in diameter. Um, I, I have another one of these in my collection that has the original blue and pink ribbons, but it's very difficult to photograph. But they wore this thing on a sash. You know, they had this, like, um, like 
sash of pink and blue ribbon with a floret, and then this button was right in the middle of the floret. And again, its Greek motto is fellowship of lovers of learning, and its Latin motto, virtue, knowledge, and friendship, is pretty typical of, of these college secret societies. This is not a secret society medal, but this is another one I couldn't resist putting in uh, from, the, from the, um, uh, the literary society at King's College, which is now Columbia University in New York. Um, it was actually formed by uh, uh, the faculty and a group of prominent citizens, this club, was to give out, to do nothing but fund and give out prizes to students at what was then King's College. Um, this is just a great medal. It's a gigantic medal. There are three of them that I think exist. Um, one privately, one at the University, at the Museum of the City in New York, one at Columbia, and about half of them were engraved by Elisha Gallaudet. Um, in the, it's featured in the July issue of the Numismatist, and the article, there's this, all this controversy you may know about, about the um, um, continental dollar, which now it's felt it was not engraved by Elisha Gallaudet, but there's actually documentary evidence that this was engraved by him. Um, Columbia, just as these other um, uh, colleges, did have secret societies, the two, two main ones. One is the Philalexian Society. It was founded in 1802. Uh, Philalexian meaning lover of discourse, and that surgam meaning I shall rise. And then um, the other one was the Pethiologian Society, which was founded in 1806, which had both membership medals but also award medals. Um, and I'm going to kind of you know, move a little faster here, so we won't go into a lot of detail about them. Um, Bowdoin had uh, at least three secret societies, certainly that we have medals from, and there were probably others. The top one and the bottom were the two competing literary debate academic societies, the Pusinian Society and the Athenian Society, um, and the, the Athenian being established as a rival to the Pusinian by a, a Pusinian who, didn't, who was a little bit disgruntled. Um, the Pusinian Society was originally formed as the Philomathian Society, but because they thought that was kind of commonplace, like every college had a Philomathian Society, they changed their name to Pusinian, which means pine covered, and that's based on a line from Virgil, uh, Virgil's Aeneid, we will always have the whispering pines, which if you know Maine is, is kind of tip, is appropriate to that, to that location. The Ovarian Society was, a, was more a drinking club. Uh, it, you know, they, they uh, had these kind of funny, funky oval medals uh, with a motto that means he began from an egg and, um, you know, and they drank and they held monk trials. The president was known as the most glorious grand rooster and the secretary was the great chicken. And uh, if I remember, if I remember this right, I think this was the one that had in their constitution officially that each, at each meeting, they would have four bottles of wine. And as they grew, they're like, no, this, Four bottles is not enough, so they changed their constitution to say five bottles of wine. And as they grew a little bit more, they said, this is not enough. Let's just make it half a bottle of wine for everybody who's here. And, um, and if you lost the mock trial, or if you weren't there, I mean, if you lost the mock trial, there was a fine, but if you weren't there, you were fined one bottle of the finest wine that they could find. So that yeah, gives you a sense of some of the difference between some of these more literary secret societies and some of the more fun-loving secret societies. Um, South Carolina College, which is now the University of South Carolina, had a Euphradian society and also a, there was a competing society. Um, Georgetown had two, uh, again, two uh, societies. They weren't really secret and they were established uh, under the sponsorship of the brothers who ran Georgetown at that time to foster uh, literary debate, in effect. So there's the Philodemic Society and the Philonomosian Society that were both formed in the 1830s. This medal um, is a little bit later. It's, it's gold. This, this picture doesn't really capture the color very well. Um, 
and it's secret, it's, it, it still exists today. In fact, our, our, uh, our good friend John Kralovich was, a, um, was a, an elected officer of this club. And every time I see him, he says, hey, do you still have that University of Virginia uh, Jefferson Medal? Um, this is actually a good example of the point that I made earlier, which is that even where the existence of the society and some, even some of the, the names of the members of the society were not secret, they still had and still have secret aspects of it. And one of them, which I kind of figured out with the help of a Latin scholar friend of mine, is the motto you can see below that, that, that a view of the academic village that Jefferson designed, which is now the core of the University of Virginia campus, uh, underneath there, there's a Latin motto, haec olum meminis huabit, which literally means it will be pleasant to remember these things. So it's kind of sentimental. Um, you know, here's a picture of the college, it will be pleasant to remember these things. Okay, great. Only for a classical scholar, they would immediately recognize that that refers to perhaps the most famous line from Virgil's Aeneid, which is actually forson et haec olum meminis huabit, which means perhaps someday it will be pleasant to remember even this. And the, it, it occurs in the first book of Virgil's Aeneid where Odysseus and his men get shipwrecked and they're all moaning and groaning about how did you get us into this mess? And he says, perhaps someday it will be pleasant to remember even this. So, so if you're a Latin scholar and you see this medal, you, you kind of like smile and burst out laughing or whatever. Um, as I said, the, the Greek letter fraternities emerged in the 1820s, uh, and this is my fraternity pin from Theta Delta Chi, um, uh, typical of modern fraternity pins. But it was, it was in a way based on Phi Beta Kappa, these, these Greek letter societies. Um, uh, there was a uh, union, there was a, a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa at, at Union College. It was at that time in the 1830s, 1820s, still secret, still literary, still scholarly. Um, but there were some, other, some you know, young men there uh, who thought that that wasn't exactly what they wanted. So they started this thing called Kappa Alpha in 1825. And that was very quickly um, also joined by Sigma Phi and Delta Phi in 1827. And that is what's now considered or, or discussed or, um, described as the Union Triad. And these are the original uh, three modern Greek letter fraternities. They were very soon after that, within a couple of decades, followed by branches at other, um, at other colleges. I think Sigma Phi was the one that started this, this movement to, to establish chapters elsewhere. And then you have the second Union Triad, which includes Theta Delta Chi, which was formed in, I think, 1847. Um, but by the 1830s, you know, this concept is really, you know, there are many, many more colleges being established in the early United States and at each one of these Greek letter fraternities being established. Still some of these typical, um, you know, more early American college secret societies, but much more of the Greek letter system. Um, so let me kind of wrap up by talking about collecting these pieces. Um, until very recently, you know, it was extraordinarily difficult to do any kind of research on them. Even today with the internet, it's still, given what's on these medals, I mean, you know, mostly you have, you know, some initials, maybe a Latin motto, maybe a date. It's still very difficult, even with the internet, to figure out what they are. And so a lot of times, if you're gonna, get, first, it's, isn't, it would not not be that easy to collect these. There just aren't that many of them still around. Um, but even if you decided to do that, at each moment, almost no one knows about these, so you're gonna see one in a coin dealer or metal dealer's case, and you're gonna have to decide, he doesn't know anything about it, you don't know anything about it, do you buy it or don't you buy it? And in a couple of cases, I bought them, you know, in the, this Colby, Co what turned out to be a Colby College medal I bought, actually in the late 1970s, it was $10. It was in a group of medals, that I wanted, so I bought that one too, and it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I figured out what it was. Similarly, with this Denison University, uh, it was then the Granville Literary and Theological Institution, Stan Steinberg had it, it wasn't that expensive. Um, 
you know, and I bought it and I figured out that it was this and it was actually, the way I figured it out was I found almost exactly the same mat metal for Yale, for Yale's Calliope and Society, but it had different Greek letters and figured out that this was one of the, um, one of the very few of these societies where somebody who knew about Yale's Calliope and Society established a Calliope and Society at Denison uh, based on that, and so the medal is, is almost exactly the same. This Brown University medal is doubly interesting. Um, this is one I decided, this particular medal is one that I decided not to buy. Uh, Stan had it. I thought it was just a little too expensive. I had no idea what it was. He sold it to Jonathan Brecker, who's here. Jonathan is a good friend, so he offered it to me at a little bit more than what he paid Stan for, and I was like, nah, I don't, I don't think I want it. Jonathan sold it to John Kralovich, and John, of course, you know, being the scholar that he is, figured out what it was. It's from Brown University, and then he offered it to me, and then he wanted, you know, more money. And at that point, I, you know, I probably, I sort of kicked myself for not buying it, but it all worked out great because this morning I bought one of these from Tony Terranova. I am so excited. I am so excited. So anyway, thank you, Tony. Um, yeah, well, uh, I don't want to get into that, but <laughs> it was, it was fair enough. It was fair. It was fair enough. Yeah, it was fair enough. Um, so, so some of these though, they're still not, um, I got five minutes. I get three minutes. Okay. All right. So, so some of these are, are, um, I still don't know what they are. I, you know, here's one again, I bought it. I didn't know what it was, still have it. I think it's from Bradford College, which was a college that existed briefly, you know, maybe for several decades in the 19th century in Haverhill, Mass. But if anybody knows, uh, it's, it's not, it's definitely not from the Phi Beta Phi that is the women's fraternity that exists today, which was established in, I don't know, the 1940s or something like that. Uh, it's some, it's, it, to me, it looks like it's an early American college secret society medal. I just don't know from where. Um, and then there are also medals that are a little bit later that kind of fit into this category and are cool. Uh, here are two from Tufts. This top one went through a fire, but even at that, it's kind of a cool thing. Um, it was this order of the coffee pot was an offshoot of Theta Delta Chi. Uh, started at a late night party after students who were inclined to more studious things had gone to bed. And then this order of the round table was established as a rival to that one. But they both are defunct. You know, they only existed for about 10 years, but these are very cool medals. So we've talked about, you know, secret societies generally, some of the early American college secret societies, Phi Beta Kappa, um, how they were, uh, the, the, some of the other colleges that had these medals, uh, these societies and these medals, and then how the Greek letter uh, fraternities superseded them starting in about the 1820s, 1830s, and then how if you want to collect them, don't, just let me know when you see them, okay? <laughs> Thanks. Uh, do I still have like one one minute for questions or are we